You're listening to Conversations in Atlantic Theory, a podcast dedicated to books and ideas generated from and about the Atlantic world. In collaboration with the Journal of French and Francophone Philosophy, these conversations explore the cultural, political, and philosophical traditions of the Atlantic world, ranging from European critical theory to the Black Atlantic to sites of indigenous resistance and self-articulation, as well as the complex geography of thinking between traditions, inside traditions, and from positions of insurgency, critique, and counter-narrative. Today's conversation is with Alvin Henry, who teaches in the Department of English at St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, where he writes on African-American literature and literary theory. He is the author of the 2020 book, Black Queer Flesh, Rejecting Subjectivity in the African-American Novel, published by University of Minnesota Press, in which we are discussing today. Alvin, hello. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for having me today. It's great to have you here. Um, You know, I have said this to you, and so I'll say it in this context again. I absolutely love this book. It's it's so interesting and innovative and important, and I loved reading it. I actually read it twice, um, and it's just so full of insights and full of unique vision and interpretation. And I really want us to get a chance to get into some of that today. But I wanted to start off really by saying thank you for for this book. I think it's it breathes so much fresh air into African-American literary studies. And, um, it was just a gift when it showed up and um, reading it and loving uh, the kind of vision you have as a scholar. Uh, thank you very much. I- really appreciate you reading it especially twice um <laughs> yes <laughs> i read it uh yeah uh we could talk offline about the 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 two times but um it has a lot of it it is a, a very well written book but it is also a very dense book in the sense of it requires very careful reading i mean dense in the, in the very best sense it, it does require a careful attention and is worth the, the a slow read uh, for sure but before we get into the specifics of the book, I wanted to ask you, and this is an invitation to, to you know, any element of the sort of personal journey you want, but uh, along with that, uh, really the intellectual uh, narrative of how you came to this project. Because as you know, one doesn't just write a book sort of in a week. It requires this massive investment of energy and time and resources and often self-esteem. Um, so something draws us there, and I wonder what what brought you to this project in terms of your curiosities, your your intellectual passions, and so on. Thanks for that question. You're right. It, the these books take for close to a decade if you include graduate school in them, um, and writing the dissertation and revising it. But I think for me, the big question that drew me to this project was. Um, Du Bois's concept of double consciousness and the split ego. These concepts have always fascinated me as an analytic, but also as a way to understand how oppression and racism can imperil not just our physical safety, but also our minds and our sense of who we are. Um, Mm -hmm. Specifically, like what we believe are our limitations, what we think we can achieve, um, and what internally has been redesigned to keep us oppressed. So I think for me, um, going back to like the origin question of like, why would one invest so much time in these type of projects? So I think I grew up in a very abusive household and I was always looking for an escape. Um, And this required me to think about physical safety, but also what other ways of thinking about the self might we need to actually be free? Uh, Mm -hmm. So freedom for me um, was not just from harm and oppression, but something that influenced how I asked questions about the world. Um, like, what do we mm-hmm. actually need to, to get a certain type of identity um, that will enable us to have the transformative power um, to craft our own identity? Um, and very much for me, it's following Bell Hooks's advice to speak with a liberated voice. To And this idea of liberated voice is very much shaping my questions. Um, so I think that for me, the book and the project um, are ways that identity have been limited 
not just by existing power structures, but also to ask questions about what else is limiting identity, um, especially mm -hmm. what we haven't paid attention to in the past, um, things that we might have forgotten that would allow us to gain a more fuller expression of self and voice. Yeah, I, I, just to follow up on that, I mean, do you have you obviously the book is concerned with you know particular figures, but just in general of the African American literary tradition? I mean, and you mentioned Du Bois. Do you think of the the African this this as a, a, a particularly emphatic or important feature, you know, uh, of the African American intellectual and literary traditions? You know, is is that also part of what drew you to that way of addressing this general concern that you have, that you articulate in terms of safety, limitation, identity, um, and self-making? Yeah, I, th I think that, I think this is like a question that people in the field grapple with one way or the other, this idea of double consciousness and what it means to, to craft an identity. And so I think some people t approach the field from a more sociological analysis, looking at power and systems of, mm -hmm. of power. And then other people look at more identity, individual everyday experiences. Um, so for me, it's, it's trying to figure out the balance between the two and the book is an attempt to address both of them simultaneously to show mm -hmm. how the individual is shaped by cultural systems of power and, and vice versa. How can the individual resist them and possibly reshape them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, to get to the, to sort of push that in then to the book, um, and in this way, really uh, kind of just the book cover, um, I wonder if you could walk through the title and subtitle of the book. Um, it's to me, I mean, like a great title and subtitle, it contains, you know, all the promises of the book, right? Titles don't always do that, but yours really does, right? And so this phrase, which is the title, uh, Black Queer F Flesh, right, tells a huge amount of the story of the book, right? But also the, this, this rejection of subjectivity, that's the subtitle, right? These two things together. And I just wondered if you could just walk us through the, the title and subtitle a little bit. Um, with particular, I mean, in particular, I have in mind why this word flesh, right? Which is different than body, which is different than like, you know, color. Um, flesh is a, a, a very suggestive and, and evocative term. And then rejection of subjectivity, which really, you know, we'll have a lot of time to talk about it, uh, I hope. Um, but that's like, for me, that was the thing that that really jolted me about the book title was like rejection of subjectivity in an age where I think so much of our public intellectual discourse is around agency, right? Mm -hmm. And that agency falling back so much on, you know, habitual or everyday sort of common notions of subjectivity. And here's a book, right, that says flesh in the title and that says rejection of subjectivity. And I was like, just talking about the title itself, I think, is really interesting. So I wanted to ask, you know, if you could sort of talk through the title and subtitle a little bit. Definitely. definitely. Uh, I, let me start with the subtitle. Uh, so rejecting subjectivity in the African-American novel. So my book is trying to intervene in, in the field by calling attention to our fascination with subjectivity and our dedication to becoming subjects. So I'm asking scholars with that subtitle to rethink our reliance on subjectivity, as you were mentioning. It's like, this is what our public facing um, discourse is about. Um, and to reimagine instead alternative ontological frameworks for the self. So I found that there is a concerted effort uh, by black authors to reject this whole idea of subjectivity. Um, and they found it to be a tool of oppression and not a natural phenomena, but rather a tool of anti-Black racism. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I look at subjectivity, this is emerging out of for largely liberal humanism thought. Um, and we can trace it back to the Renaissance and possibly um, the Greeks um, or the emergence of racial capitalism. But the basic tenets that I'm, I'm dealing with with subjectivity are this idea of a unified self, the end at the border of my skin, um, a self-contained ego and before Freud, 
we talked about we would have language of like the unified or individuated eye or a body mind that directs my actions or agency, uh-huh. as you mentioned. Um, and so I have control of myself. Um, and the subjectivity obviously is shaped by society um, and stuff, but largely it follows self-possession, self-determination. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this model of subjectivity has been very useful in advancing political and social change. But authors that I've examined uh, focus on how this system of selfhood oppressed Black queers and suppressed their cultures and histories. So the mm-hmm. quest here is that authors are doing is saying, how do I resist subjectivity and how do I get rid of it when it is the only model in circulation? So yeah. when subjectivity is the default, how do you, is there another way to select another model of the self? Um, and so this leads to the, the second part or the first part actually of the title, um, Black Queer Flesh. And so for this part, um, it's defined, I define it as um, rather than looking at a unified self, the self becomes unbounded and enters a sense of plurality and collectivity, more mm-hmm. a we rather than an I. And so this diminished sense of self has less self-control. There's no more of a sense that I end at my skin and the self is now continuous with Black queer life, um, tapping into the souls of Black queer folk. Mm-hmm. Um, and one way to imagine this is like kind of like a rhizomatic network of, of histories and um, of people over time. Um, but flesh particularly, I draw upon Hortense Spiller's work um, and her theorizations of flesh. Um, and I can go into the mechanics of it, but at a very high level, I'm not trying to just queer spillers work um at all but Mm -hmm. maybe um but try to figure out how authors have used this idea of flesh making um but applied that to the idea of subjectivity so rather Mm -hmm. than flesh for spillers is a way of stripping away identities um and turns into a place of rupture and pain and lack of signification um then identities are then forced upon uh, black flesh. But my, my work looks at what happens if you do that work to subjectivity itself, how uh-huh. do you strip it away? Um, and so looking at black authors who have, are concerned with creating characters in a very realistic tradition. So they're thinking about both the everyday life of how might this actually play out, but also imaginatively to think about how the self could be stripped of subjectivity and mm-hmm. to join in this queer black flesh. So I think it's a potential to imagine the self very much beyond the individuated ego and this cohesive self. That's great. I, I'm glad I asked because that's such a, um, you know, I, I mean, what I said about the title and subtitle is it contains so much of the trajectory of the book, right? And so much of the real substance of your thinking in the book. And so hearing you talk about it, it, it really, you know, it, uh, it gives a lot of, you know, just to use the, the term, it really gives a lot of flesh to a lot of, a lot of embodiment to, to this, to this methodology or interpretive frame, um, however you wanted to characterize it. And I think that that's, it's really important. Uh, it's such an important part of the book, not only because, you know, I mean, it's the thing that you and I share as intellectuals of, you know, a concern with, you know, theorizing ways of interpreting, um, you know, life, interpreting texts and so forth. And so that theoretical, uh, you know, preoccupation, it's not just that, it's that in the case of your book, right, where your focus, I mean, you cover a lot of different, you know, writers and theorists, but the focus is really on Nella Larson, Ralph Ellison and Richard Wright. And in doing that, I mean, I remember opening up the book and, you know, I, I always start with the, the uh, bibliography and then I look at the, uh, everybody looks at the acknowledgements. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I think we're supposed to be embarrassed about that. I'm not. Um, <laughs> but then the table of contents and I looked at the table of contents and I was like, okay, so Alvin decided I'm going to talk about three of the most talked about figures in African-American literature. And that's a real task to set yourself. Like, how can you say something new about these figures, right? And 
part of what I find so impressive about the book is that it felt to me like reading Larson and Ellison and Wright for the first time or in a completely new way. They were almost like new figures. That's a, uh, not an easy thing to do. And so I'm curious how, you know, you think that this frame of, of, of black queer flesh and also the rejection of subjectivity, but especially this, the, the title and the motif of black queer flesh opens up a new horizons for how we understand their work. Because of course, theory is not just a, a thing that floats as a sort of conceptual problem. It is also something that when we deploy it as readers, we see something in the work that you wouldn't see otherwise, right? That, that without theory in place, we don't see something. And then with that theory in place, that thing sort of leaps out at us. In the case, and you don't have to go one by one, you know, you may think of a sort of general take on this, but I'm curious what you think this frame of black queer flesh does to draw out something new. Like what does it draw out new about Larson, Ellison, Wright, and African-American uh, literature maybe more broadly? Yeah, I think I'm glad that the book is helping give a fresh read on these like classics uh, because it's, you know, everyone wants to reread them, but we often, when I reread stuff, it's usually after I read a journal article and it's like, ooh, I have a new new perspective. Yeah. Um, and I've already had, I've had an email from a couple of people specifically around Ellison who they're like, I've never, I never wanted to teach Ellison again because I thought he was too masculinist or something like that along those <laughs> lines. And they're like, I read your book. And I was like, I can now teach Ellison again. And I was like, okay. I was like, that's great. Um, because I really like the idea of opening Ellison up to a new generation of people who might just think like it's a tried and true story that I can just go on, you know, schmoop or something and find the plot summary. Uh, so <laughs> that's been helpful. Um, but I think one of the biggest challenges we face um, when reading these texts and, and others is how we can really understand identity and the assumptions we've made about racial formation. So in a lot of the scholarship and artistic work I've come across, a lot of it's about subverting or resisting, but often through the framework of subjectivity. Yeah. Um, and I find that there's a pushback. Um, there's a push to ask how I can change the world, how I can craft myself as a good subject. But we haven't really questioned the framework of rehabilitating subjectivity. Um, so within Black queer studies, there's often a gesture to recalibrate subjectivity so that deviance can be a legitimate form of subjectivity. Um, uh, and that yeah. work is really important in the field. Um, but what I'm doing is trying to say, I found this one group of authors who said, why don't we just actually circumvent the whole structure of subjectivity and identity as we know it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's skip deviance, which is good for other strategies. But how do we work with these feelings of inferiority and shame of living in the closet? Um, is there something else available to us? So I think that Ellison, Wright, Larson, and more recently, Sadia Hartman's work, um, they're thinking differently about marginalization and deviance. So if yeah. we look at Larson's work, for example, through the lens of Black queer flesh, we can immediately see her struggling with how to shape her characters within the confines of queerness as bad, as marginal, and as, as abject. And so for Larson and many other queer writers and people, we don't feel queerness is bad or marginal. And so she's trying to, I think, or I argue um, in quicksand to try to navigate subjectivity um, and trying to choose deviancy, um, but it doesn't really work out for her. So for her, I think that she's showing us that built into subjectivity itself are the tools to oppress queer people and black people from the start. So you're adopting this model that's already going to put you at a disadvantage. And mm -hmm. Arson is saying like, well, why do I need to try to rehabilitate this model if it's already designed to oppress me? Um, so yeah, that's... I think... That's really brilliant. I, I I love that. And it, just to pick up a, what you had said about about Ellison and and you know getting emails saying you know he just seemed too 
sort of conventionally masculine, but this has changed the uh, sort of teachability of, of Ellison. I mean, it, it's my own version of that sort of, uh, of that sort of question and I have a thought on this, but it's a, you know, this is a conversation. So it's a question for you is, you know, one of the interesting things for me, just as a, an event of picking up the book, right. Is looking at the title. And then when I get to the table of contents, when I read black queer flesh and rejection of subjectivity, right. I did not expect, you know, Wright and Ellison, right. Who, for who, with whom you know no one has associated as, as you know any sense of in terms of identity a sense of queerness and that you don't take up say baldwin and hansberry who you know just by uh, in terms of biography would have maybe lent themselves to you know that association that's what i, I love about the book and, and it, it's it's one of the many things that's so unexpected about it and it's just this occasion for me then to ask especially in the case of Wright and ellison You've, you've already spoken of, uh, about Larson. Like, what is, you know, there's, what is, what is this, this treatment of, of queerness as a methodology and strategy against subjectivity? Um, you know, what does it draw out of Ellison and Wright? But there's also that other thing about how does your methodology or strategy of, of reading also expand the reach of queerness as a mode of, of reading? You know, to, I mean, you're not, you know, other people have too, but you, you so directly and emphatically in the choice of Ellison and, and Wright, you know, you know, uh, state, the book is staged. It's like an event of mismatch at a sort of first take level. And then the reading does something so different. So I wonder both what, you know, in terms of what it brings out of Ellison and Wright, but also what does it say about this as a, uh, an interpretive frame for reading literature that it's, that it's really about a different kind of encounter with the literature. That's not about biography. It's not about, as you were talking about, finding modes of resistance that end up looking just like embrace of conventional notions of subjectivity. I think that, um, thanks for that question, because it really draws out that kind of, why is right in the book? Um, And I'm hoping that people will see um, how my work is very much grounded in queer color critique um, and its commitment to critiquing sexuality as a discourse. So I'm invested in revealing how categories work to shape and define and police us um, and the mechanisms that reinforce these categories. So mm-hmm. sexuality is very complicated, um, like subjectivity, it has many assumptions and investments in power. So queer black flesh as a method in my work is two things. So first, it's the process of abnegating um, layers of subjectivity. And then second, it's the, a way of existing in the world as Black queer flesh, as this open, plural, collective self. So there's two ways of using the term Black queer flesh, both as a process and a state of being, um, which can be both confusing, but also um, I feel like that's the part of the queer element to it. it, it just like one unified definition wouldn't really work. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, for scholarly purposes, it might've been a bad choice. Uh, But as a process, (laughs) uh, but as a process though, my framework I hope um, can be applied to other groups of people who have been besieged by subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So a colleague of mine um, who works in decolonial studies in Indian literature, for example, has already told me that black queer flesh as a method, right? As this ablation of subjectivity has helped him kind of solve some of the problems he's been working in um, in the British post-colonial context. So in that way, I hope that it could be used for other people um, also. Um, And so that's partly how Wright and Ellison get into the text. But at the same time, my book does center fictionalized lived lived experiences of Black queer people. Um, And so I'm a scholar of Black queer studies with a nod to LGBT history. So queer mm-hmm. studies is like a non-normative methodology, but also I have this tension where I'm also looking at people who historically have been labeled and self-identified as LGBT. Mm-hmm. Um, so in this way, when I look at Invisible Man through the prism of Black queer flesh, uh, I was able to reclaim Invisible Man himself as a queer punk. So mm-hmm. he's undoubtedly queer, but we've read him for all these years or decades 
um, as straight. Uh, and mm -hmm. so my book reveals how Ellison is proposing also uh, a theory of disability in this novel that scholars have really overlooked. Um, and so this new frame, this new methodology allows us to see that there are alternative ways of being beyond just like LGBT queerness, but also disability studies and dis disability communities. Um, and Ellison really plays with those ideas and concepts to, to come up with this a fabulous like concept of black disability. Um, and so, and for Richard Wright, his last two novels, The Long Dream, and then its sequel, The Island of Hallucination, which is in the Beinecke Library and an unpublished, it features a bisexual protagonist, as well as a gay character that's based on James Baldwin. Um, mm -hmm. So part of my work is committed to centering LGBT lives, but also problematizing the category of sexuality. Um, and so I, I think that by focusing on Black queer flesh as a methodology, we can bring back this idea of, of the self-abnegation process mm -hmm. um, and critique of subjectivity, but I'm also picking texts that do have a LGBT element to them. That's fantastic. I mean, I, that, that, that formulation of a methodology and the way it allows you to not just select, as you say, you know, sort of select these moments or these characters, um, it, it, for me, it demonstrates in practice rather than a meta reflection. It, it, it shows us in practice, you know, the power of, of theoretical approaches, right. To, to, to not only like draw out something in the familiar, right. In the cases of these figures you're talking about, but also these texts, it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're re, um, your re-theorization or your reframing of, of Invisible Man is, is, yeah, it's, you know, I'm teaching Invisible Man next academic year. And I was like, that just got a lot more complicated for me. And a really great, I mean, and I mean that like, I like complicated, right? <laughs> That's why this whole yes. endeavor of academia <laughs> is worth it. It got so much more complicated because of your book, because, it, it, you know, it, it was able to draw a thing out uh, that, that I don't think, people were seeing, but also, you know, the Richard Wright stuff, uh, I, you know, seeing Richard Wright as something more than just, you know, James Baldwin's antagonist or, you know, uh, some, uh, somebody who writes novels about men who kill women, you know, this is this. Exactly. It unlocks his, his deeper endeavor, you know, and you mentioned sort of sociological approaches to literature. Actually, I have to say, I, I really appreciate that, that, you know, I, I think you do a lot to remind us that that Wright was an artist and not a sociologist, just to be kind of boring terminologically about yeah. it. Um, and that, I think, is very needed as well. You know, and, and you said somebody had written you about, about you know, coming back to Ralph Ellison and around, you know, sort of changing a perspective on his, his masculinity. The idea of returning to Richard Wright is is that's an even taller task, and I think you really accomplish it with the with the methodology, but also the selection, as you said, of different <laughs> texts. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So, in the opening book, uh, opening of the book, and this was another thing that that caught me by surprise, and and it may be something that you say it's actually not that big a deal. Why are you asking? <laughs> Which is fine, um, but you you do use this term, repeat this term a number of times of a bildungsroman. Right. And that for me was so interesting and intriguing that that would be an element of your framing of the project. So I just wanted to ask, you know, what, what does this term do? You know, what work does it do in the text? What do you, why, why is it important to be a part of the way you get the project started? So this is a, a fun term for, for listeners, not inside of literature. Um, let me just explain what it is. Uh, the Bildung Roman is what we call in our field this novel of self formation, or often it's called or mistranslated as the novel of education. But here, this is when a character matures slowly over time. They have obstacles, they screw up, they learn from them. And then the novel usually concludes with them integrating into society via marriage, inheritance, and profession. But the ultimate goal is they become this great subject or a 
you know, not great, but a subject of some mm-hmm. sort. Um, and so most canonical texts in African-American literature are some version of the Bildungsroman. It's one of the most popular forms, the dominant form. And if we extend it to the slave narratives, which are, are nonfiction, they also follow almost this, the Bildungsroman trajectory to a T, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's this idea that we need to craft ourselves into a subject um, that is so fascinating and preoccupies African-American authors. Um, so the idea of becoming a good subject or even a deviant subject in, in lots of queer writing, but we're celebrating the process of becoming a subject. It's just everywhere. You can look at most TV shows and movies to also mm-hmm. do this. But what my project shows us is that black authors haven't just been writing the Billings Roman tradition. Everyone just think Larson, Richard Wright, um, Invisible Man. These are all just Billings Romans and you're just like, you know, you could go to Wikipedia and I think they're listed mm-hmm. as examples of it. Um, but instead, what I'm showing is that they created a unique literary genre, one that we have ignored, one that's about self-abnegation, subjectivity, and this embrace of Black queer flesh. So this is an aesthetic practice that, that scholars have completely like not paid attention to, and we should be celebrating these authors, not for whatever, whatever they've been celebrated in the past for, but they've actually created a new literary genre that's just completely gone overlooked. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's a way of showing another form of aesthetics that to be able to resist anti-Black racism um, and to fight against normative aesthetics. So Black authors weren't just tinkering with the building Roman and fitting in the Black experience, but they created a new genre. And I think that, as you were saying, um, in the question that Wright himself, we need to think of him as an aesthetic innovator. You know, he might have been, it might have taken him until his last novel to jump on the bandwagon, but he was reading deeply Larson and um, and Ellison to figure out what is this new genre that they're participating in, they're creating, hmm. and how can I like pivot my work right after his existential phase? He like goes back to this protest fiction in The Long Dream but it's not just protest fiction. It's like the black queer flesh genre. And so I think that we need to really celebrate this new literary genre that they've created. Yeah, I really like that. I mean, it's, um, I like, I really like that answer. And I like the way that, that you raise the stakes of, of your book, right? It's about, it's not only about articulating and naming and 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 drawing out this uh, this emerging genre, um, but also understanding Richard Wright, as you said, Richard Wright as an innovator, and and there's so much. I, I you know I do think a lot about how our reading of of Richard Wright, and just to focus on him for a minute, um, how much our reading of Richard Wright is framed by you know, Baldwin's sort of nonstop, even after his death, um, you know, just broadsides about it's, you know, it's all, you know, captivation by the white gaze. It's all protest novels, right? Um, I never quite think protest novels are as bad as as Baldwin (laughs) seems to think they are. Um, But also Ellison's, uh, you know, uh, I mean, he adopts it from Irving Howe, but this characterization of Wright as a sociologist rather than a, than a a writer. Um, And I think part of the resistance to that in Wright's work is his nonfiction and his sort of engagement with Bandung and, and, you know, color, the color curtain and all of that. But what you do is pick up, you know, pick up what for me is the most important thing to to retrieve. I don't want to say say, but to retrieve about Richard Wright, which is not to say he gave up fiction. I feel like sometimes my own take on Richard Wright is like, it sounds like he gave up fiction to become like an observant nonfiction writer. But you're pointing out he's developing as a creative. He's developing as a writer. He's actually reading and thinking about people, contrary to you know Baldwin's own sort of accounts of of Richard Wright's late life, where he's like Richard just sat in apartments drinking wine and having parties. He sort of demeans him in that way, rather than seeing him as an evolving artist. Yeah, I think one thing I wasn't able to include in the book was. Um, 
the the island of hallucination analysis i was not granted permission to publish from the right estate oh um, really so, that's too bad yeah but he one thing just to to continue your idea of like right as an aesthetician is like he actually in his protest fiction he just makes surface the idea of self-abnegation. So Larson and Wright, they're more subtle. You have to read for it. But Wright's just like right on the surface. He was like, okay, they've invented <laughs> this stuff. Let me just make this popular and like tell you all how to do it. And so in his text, he's like very upfront about we all need to get rid of subjectivity. This is a thing controlling us. Um, and in his novel, Island of Hallucination, he then goes on and says, okay, I've gotten rid of subjectivity. Let me show you what life is like as black queer flesh. How do I live it every day in the everyday world? Mm -hmm. um, and so in that text, um, or at least my analysis that's just sitting in a file on my computer now, I walk you through how Wright actually does that. So I could only find um, one of my the prime examples today was from Cydia Hartman's work from just a few years ago. Um, but Wright actually in 1959 had this example of, of black queer flesh as like an everyday lived experience. And he thought through that problem of how do I do this? And one of his critiques is Baldwin, you can't do it, but I figured it out in my other character that plays opposite you. How the right estate has to release that then and publish it in whatever form it is and have you write an introduction. Because I think, you know, it's you know, not to, to go off on too much of a tangent, but I think this is, central both to like the significance of your book and also to that period of African-American literature and how we think about it is not only is it dominated by Baldwin's critique of right and Ellison's as well, but also this sense that right doesn't speak back to it in any really significant way. Um, and what you're saying here is that, no, these are ex literary experiments in which he's not just responding defensively, but sort of on the offense, right? By by creating rather than proving them wrong, but creating something new. Yeah, yeah. He one ups them actually. It's uh, literary estates are just they really are their own phenomenon. <laughs> so let me jump to the end of the book and this notion of utopia that you use as a sort of concluding motif, which I found such to be a, a fascinating term to, to, to employ uh, at the close. Um, just, it's a very open question. You know, what, what is your sense of utopia in this concluding part? And what, what drew you to making this as the center of how you wrapped up really detailed, complicated reflections in the body of the text? Yeah, I think, for me, I wanted to to showcase this alternative way of being um, and to really push it forward through the utopian lens of this idea of like how we move forward, but we don't have a full definition. We don't have it all laid out perfectly, but it's something to strive for. Uh, so I, I guess for me, I wanted to talk about both utopia as a strategically useful project um, versus like an ideal human existence. And so for me, um, strategically, um, black queer people are policed, they're oppressed, but they have to throw off their identities and they seek solidarity in everyday life by joining black queer flesh. It's not just our thoughts, we're all together. Um, and so this idea of actually doing this work of self-abnegation and challenging subjectivity is very strategically useful. And so in that way, it's a utopian measure of practice. And I, I think that Wright's um, The Long Dream, at least, is a version of this. And then Ellison in Invisible Man is more along the strategic lines. But if we think about utopia as an ideal human existence, um, to think about a society devoid of anti-Blackness, um, where there's genuine human flourishing that involves this plural collective mode of being, we can look more towards Nell Larson's model and Sadia Hartman's model mm -hmm. um, that this is the ideal, not having domination in our lives. Um, so I think that the book kind of, I liked, 
I like the closing of the book because it both offers you Jim Trueblood example um, in Ellison, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. as a strategic version, but also the ideal version in Hartman. Um, and so I think that that idea of looking forward to something is very much what like people like Nadia Ellis and Jose Munoz are, are thinking about as like this queer vision or horizon not yet becoming of queerness. Yeah, no, it was, it, it, I, I loved that at the end. I mean, you know, I've thought about the term utopia in lots of ways, especially in sort of French post-structuralism. And, um, but I think you have just such interesting things to say about it. And, um, you know, if nothing else, everybody should read the conclusion, <laughs> read the rest of the book too. But, but I think it's, 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 you know, it's for me, it's like the, the evocation of utopia is like so much of the book where it takes a common term, right? The Bildungsroman, um, you know, Larson, Wright, Ellison, utopia, these things that I think for a lot of us who work on literature, culture, and theory are so familiar, but then they just become completely defamiliarized in your, in your work. And that, that notion of utopia uh, I think it's as much of a challenge as giving a, a different reading of Invisible Man, you know, it's, uh, and you, you pull it off in really provocative ways. So let me also, let me shift a little bit to, to the subtitle uh, again, which you've talked about quite a bit. And this is maybe one of those like zoom out from the particularities of, of analysis and think about the significance of, of this motif in the book or this, this aim of the book thinking about the rejection of subjectivity. And when I got done with the book, I, you know, one of the things I really reflected on uh, was how we structure the African-American intellectual tradition. You know, there are sort of certain uh, disjuncts, right? Certain crossroads that we bring thinkers to, you know, assimilation or revolution, right? Sort of, you know, that, you know, the way, you know, Du Bois and Washington end up getting staged as the sort of two paths in this, this turn of the century tradition, or, um, you know, do we embrace the idea of race or do we work towards its abolition? Do we emphasize culture or do we emphasize politics, art or sociology? You know, a lot of the things that, that, you, that you've touched on already. And I wonder if, you know, when you think about the, the ultimate impact of the book, if you think this question of reject subjectivity as it's as a as, a, as an extant or, or you know everyday description and, and concept, uh, either rejection or aspiration, if this is one way of restructuring our interpretation of the entire African American tradition, I mean, you talk about particular figures, but it strikes me that this: do we aspire to subjectivity or do we reject it? is a very deep way of rethinking the entire tradition. Do you, I mean, I don't know if you have thoughts on that or, I mean, that, that was one of my takeaways, which was more in the mode of perplexity, you know, in the best sense of like really just wondering like, how, what do we do with this? Like this seems to organize a lot of the tradition in a really complicated way. Yeah. That's, uh, that's one of the questions I've been grappling with um, of what does, what are the actual implications of saying subjectivity has structured black thought and the frameworks that we use? So for example, as you're gesturing at like uplifts, respectability politics, just the normal idea of what it means to be a black subject as theorized from, you know, basically everyone in the first half of the 20th century has involved citizenship. Citizenship, citizenship right? It'd be a really difficult one, yeah. Right. It it all depends on having this unified self that has agency, has self possession, has self determination, um, ownership of the self. These are all key terms that are basically what define Black studies. And if you don't meet those criteria, there's you know you have to try to get there in the in the large sense. So, I think for Black studies. It, it really challenges the entire field to rethink our assumptions. Like who did we just center and why, and what were yeah. the costs of that? Because if subjectivity 
emerges out of liberal humanism, which thought black sub black people as inferior, then we have we're in, importing this model and we've tinkered with this model that's already inherently anti-black, and we've tried to like rehabilitate it. And then mm-hmm. on top of that rehabilitation, we've built all these models of of black thought and black identity. So what is it to go back and say, so with my chapter on Ellison, for for example, I say, okay, uh, the black subject has to, if you're not, it's very ableist, essentially. It's like, you have to work, you have to be able to be participate in society somehow. But if you're disabled, you can't. So there's something about um, the idea of what blackness is that's related to work, productivity, ableism. So how do we mm-hmm. kind of tinker with that notion, which is something I feel like we can we can understand, but the idea of being a unified subject, I think is more difficult because it has done so much work um, in, pol- in the political realm, right? To mm-hmm. have this, like, I do this, I can do that, I have this agency, I can, and, and so forth. So lots of civil rights rhetoric and even black power rhetoric is very much about this I voice who can do something yeah. rather than this more collective plural queer voice. So I think that it is going to be, I hope it's challenged to people in the field to rethink all of our assumptions about moving forward and how we use the word subjects from now on and to not, and to recognize the inheritance that we are we're perpetuating and all of its biases enfolded in the idea of subjectivity. And for me, you know, one of the things that came to mind, you know, I mentioned, of course, like it's a different way of staging, you know, some, you know, you know, the, you know, the, debates in the tradition and actually actually it may be like you know if, if we frame the tradition in that way you end up with with uh uneven sides you know because as you were saying the 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 aspiration to a conventional form of subjectivity is such a part of the tradition but also that commitment crosses lines that usually aren't crossed right but it also makes you know just this is more anecdotal but um you know, one of the things that made me rethink the rejection of subjectivity rethink is so, and this is one example, but there are so many in Baldwin's nonfiction, so many of these moments where he leaves the, not the point, but like the sort of concluding twist of his thought dangling. You know, I find him to, his nonfiction to be very elliptical, right? It's like, you, you know, it's just sort of dot, dot, dot is at the end of his thinking. And one that sort of encapsulates this for me or captures this so so clearly is, is my favorite remark in The Fire Next Time. It's in the, the long essay of The Fire Next Time where he says he's talking about integration and he says, you know, I think he's being defensive about, you know, that his pre- previous work had been sort of integrationist. And he says, you know, who would want to be or we don't want to be as Af- African-American, we don't want to be integrated into a burning house. And it's like thinking about like what houses are on fire and to be integrated into them, you know, you know, scorch you, right? Change your body from what it used to be and would therefore be a kind of death. And there are so many moments like that in somebody like Baldwin, yeah, other people as well, but just to speak to Baldwin. And after your book, I did think about that. It's like, is this this moment where he's str- he's searching for the vocabulary of a rejection of subjectivity? You know, wow, that, that'd be uh, great because I know I, I tried to look at his fiction, um, and to see if I could showcase or do a reading of one of those. But I was struck by, as you're saying, like there's a, there's usually like death or suicide um, for his queer characters, and so. I'll have to go back and look at the nonfiction with the dot, dot, dot. And, you know, this is that gesturing towards this, towards rejecting subjectivity or a new way of thinking. Because it strikes me that this, this idea of, of a rejection of subjectivity, part of what it demands, at least for me, as someone who reads, who read your book and is like rethinking or rereading like preparation for class or my own casual reading is it requires you to 
to be a creative interlocutor with the text because exactly this idea of a rejection of subjectivity that's not a common vocabulary for you know baldwin but if it's working there that's that's what we do hermeneutically right that's what we bring to the text and are able to see in the text that may not be what the text is saying out loud but instead drawn out um and that for me, I mean, that's that's the part of like, thank you for this book for me, is the way it made me think of these tropes, or not tropes, but these these moments and turns of phrases in Baldwin's nonfiction in particular, where I was like, something's going on here, and I think he can't find a way to say it. What is this thing he's not able to say? I think a lot of it is this rejection of subjectivity, because it's such a, you know, just like the disappearance of the subject in in post-structuralism it's like at some point you don't have names for it right <laughs> mm -hmm. um but you i think your readings map for us exactly what it would be to look for those moments in texts right yeah, yeah. i I'm, I'm really excited that it could be a hermeneutic for for others to find stuff because you know I'm one person, but I really would appreciate it. Oh, yeah. if, you know, it helps other people see things differently because there's just so many novels out there and authors that are reading each other that, right. If you've someone like Baldwin has read Larson and, and Ellison and Wright in depth, that it's bound to be seeping into his unconscious, even if it's not consciously theorized. Of course. And, and, you know, those three, Ellison, Baldwin, and Wright, uh, they're reading each other and they're also um, competing with each other, you know? And so, yeah. but part of, part of that competition can be exactly that, like who can find a way to begin to articulate this inarticul unarticulable thing, right? A, a rejection of subjectivity. Hmm. Well, let me ask, I, I don't know how you feel about people reading your book. I think we all probably have a mixture of anxiety about that. It's like... <laughs> Somebody's going to read what I wrote, but uh, of course we all want people to read what we wrote. Um, and readers, you know, they take f what they want from from texts. There's no way you, as an author, can have command over that. I don't think we should want to. But um, nevertheless, we, you know, as you were talking about the kinds of things that drew you to the project, I'm wondering then if you think back about what. Um, what your what you imagine readers take away from the book and i don't mean a takeaway like a quick like trope or two or or a, a quick sort of thought but like their sensibilities how do you imagine your readers sensibilities changed in the process of reading and working through the book i think i mean stories like yours like where you can, you've read the book, you have the, a grasp of the concept. And then when you look at other texts that are very familiar to you, you're like, you see them in a different way. So that, that idea of providing another way of looking at these texts is something that, you know, you can only dream that would happen. Um, so I think that's super exciting for me um, to give people another her hermeneutics of reading. Uh, but I think other things, um, I hope that they get out of it is that the method is something they can use widely. So it's not just limited to, you know, or African American literature in the 20th century or 21st mm -hmm. century, but it, it as a method, I hope people can take it to their other fields and look at other, other concepts, um, other, other imaginative um, literatures and not just, you know, keep it bound to black studies. Uh, so, that would be really exciting for me to, to see people do that. Um, but then also to get people, to get readers to say like, wow, there's another way of being besides subjectivity. And just yeah. to become aware that, oh, wow, I didn't really know that there was an alternative. It's just kind of like the default. And, yeah. Okay. Um, and so getting them to think outside of subjectivity. And we see this a lot in pop, pop culture where people are trying to push those boundaries but to maybe give them a framework for understanding how to embrace being beyond the subject mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. rejecting it. And just to see what else is possible that we've missed um, in the black queer past. So I think those are kind of ways of, I want readers to be excited that there are other things out there 
but also to just sit back and reflect that maybe I've made assumptions about subjectivity and what that that's the only way of being a, a person. I love that. I mean, I think that's it's a disconcerting thought because it's like, you know, that's a hard thing to question. And it's at the root of so many aspirations and visions of liberation. But as you said, it's not a, you're not something you're pulling from the sky. These are practices, you know, both existential practices by humans and collectives and, um, and, you know, humans as collectives, um, and also in literary works, you know, these experiments that we may not see that are maps for a different way of being. I mean, I think the book absolutely does that. So, um, I walked away from the book with that sensibility for sure. And, um, so I hope that's the same, but what about you? You know, um, you know, how do you, how did you walk away from the book? You know, because on the one hand as authors, we have a vision, it gets massively modified as you write. Cause it's one thing to think about your book in a coffee shop. It's another thing to grind it out and cry in the bedroom. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so it's an event and like all events, we're changed by it, right? We discover things, we we deepen our understanding of our intuitions and so forth. And sort of where do where do you walk out of the book as not the not a reader, but as a writer? And where does it lead you? And I say, where does it lead you? It's an invitation if you want to talk about a sort of next project. That's always like a kind of an asshole question to ask. Like, where's your next book? You just published a really fantastic one. Where's your next one? Which, you know, I'm, I'm both asking and, and don't want to act like I'm asking. <laughs> but more deeply than that, I, I wonder about your own sensibilities and how they were changed by the book and how that leads you uh, differently into projects going forward. Yeah, I, You know, this is one project that was interesting to me because I had both a, like a personal political commitment to, to understanding identity in alternative ways and ways to to kind of rut or to push out oppressive systems that kind of get inside of our psyches and kind of shape us who we, as who we are. But I think as I've written the book, um, I've kind of adopted more of Audre Lorde's position of centering the erotic, making sure that pleasure is part of my scholarly endeavors um, (laughs) and to, to look at more black literature, um, particularly black queer literature, that actually is centering pleasure. So um, as I was writing, there wasn't much work theorizing or celebrating Black queer pleasure. Um, There's lots of stuff on Black queer culture um, and Mm -hmm. such, but not on like the pleasurable aspects of it. And it wasn't like in the middle of writing, Amber Mooser's work came out um, and that work has been really helpful and inspirational for me. But um, so for me, I think my sensibility is really changed by looking at what is fun in life Um, and how are these authors centering pleasure um, in our understandings of, of the world. So not necessarily the erotic, but just pleasure in general. So I think for me, one of the projects I'm working on is um, trying to figure out where in visual and uh, cinema we can actually see black queer flesh manifesting. So doing Mm -hmm. that work, um, that chapter, the right chapter that I wasn't able to publish, doing more of that work of saying, okay, I need to, here's a method, here's a phenomenon I've I've kind of given you, but let me actually give you like concrete everyday examples of it, of people playing with this. So Mm -hmm. I think that's part of my project now is to look at more visual art um, because I think I've found artists or, or more visual artists are more interested in doing this and people um, like Marlon Riggs and Julia Dash are also thinking about this, this idea Mm -hmm. of of black queer flesh and trying to animate it without, without dominating it and turning it into a commodity or re-subject, making it a subject again, but letting it exist, letting their characters exist as flesh. Um, So I think that's my, one of my large directions. Um, But another thing I'm looking at is just, how how have like how's Afrofuturism um, attempted to aestheticize something similar of like a different way of being that might not be black queer flesh, but another mode of, of being beyond subjectivity. So I think that 
for me, my sensibility has really been shaped of going against this idea of being a subject, being a normative mm -hmm. subject. I don't want to be a deviant subject. I've been a deviant subject my entire life. I'm kind of tired of it. So I like this <laughs> <Yeah>. idea <laughs> of, of thinking alternatively um, and also just trying to document this phenomenon more for people. So I think that's where I'm going. I love that. I think that's, that's um, I can't wait to see where all that goes. You know, I'm really glad that uh, I'm really happy to hear this direction. I think that's, you know, more important work to come and um, uh, really critical, actually, that that question of, of pleasure, which is different than survival. It's different than adaptation. It's different than, as you said, deviance. Um, and as a way of you know, thinking that alongside a uh, different idea of or without the idea of subjectivity, I have this really profound project to come. So, so hurry up and write it so we can all read it. <laughs> all of that. So, well, I really appreciate you making the time. This was a great conversation, um, you know, extremely interesting and you know, draw you, you really drew out and articulated uh, so much that's important about this book. I, I, I like it, but as much as I like it, I think it's an incredibly important book for anyone working in literary studies and African American studies generally. So thank you for it. And thank you for talking through it with me today. Well, thank you so much, John. It's been a, a super fun conversation. And thank you for asking all the questions. Really appreciate right. talking about the book. All right, you take care. You too.